Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So a lot of you guys wanted me to do a kernel config for Gen 2. So here it is. I'll be going over some basic kernel stuff, then I'll be going into how I configure my kernel. So first of all, Gen 2 provides many kernels to its users. The most popular probably being the Gen 2 sources, but I prefer using the vanilla sources, which is the kernel without any third party patches. You can use the eselect kernel command to show which kernels you have installed and which kernel we have currently selected. And all this does is basically maintains a sim link inside user source that points to the kernel that we want to compile. So right now the Linux sim link is pointing to Linux 5.7.12. The configuration of your kernel is going to be written to a .config file and you can copy that config file around to keep your kernel config. But when you're upgrading to a new kernel, you would want to use the command make old config. This will take your old config and update it to the new one. Any new kernel options, it'll ask you if you want to turn it on or off. So in my case, there's no kernel changes since it's not a major update. Okay, now let's get into how I configure my kernel. So there's a legend up top telling you all the different options you can have. Most of the options you can either have it built into the kernel or as a module, which gets loaded after the kernel gets loaded. There's different use cases for each. I personally like to have my network drivers and my graphics drivers as modules. Okay, first we have general setup. So I actually use Gen2 with systemd. So inside general setup, a lot of the changes I made is because of systemd. One thing I did enable is init ram fs. I used to not use the init ram fs and I still don't, but because I want to load CPU microcode, it requires this option enabled. Inside processor types and features, I have the symmetric multiprocessing support. This is for if you have a CPU with more than one core, which is most CPUs these days. For a processor family, I have Core 2 and newer Xeon enabled. This is basically for all CPUs that's newer than the Core 2 Duo, which is pretty much all CPUs nowadays. For supported processor vendors, I have Intel enabled. For maximum number of CPUs, I have four. This is because my CPU has two physical cores and four logical threads, so I have it as four. I have multi-core scheduler support enabled, and I have Intel MCE features enabled, and other Intel microcode loading. Another thing is I have EFI runtime support and EFI stub support enabled. This is because I have EFI enabled in my BIOS. So I actually dual boot Windows and Linux, and I want to have more than four partitions, which is why I'm using EFI and GPT partitioning tables. I know some people like to use the legacy BIOS boot options, but I find this one works out for me just fine. And I can have more than four partitions, which is really nice when you're trying to dual boot or if you're trying to boot more than one Linux distro. I also have the built-in kernel command line changed. This is mostly for systemd, so the kernel knows where to look to find systemd. Inside power management, I have the suspend to RAM enabled. This way my laptop can go to sleep. And for CPU frequency governor, I have on demand. This way my CPU frequency just goes up and down depending on the workload. For bus options, I didn't change much. And for binary emulations, I didn't change much either. For firmware drivers, I have some EFI options enabled. So virtualization, this is for if you want to do any virtual box work, or if you want to do Android development with Android Studio, that requires KVM. The general architecture dependent options, this one's this option is newer and I haven't really played around with it, so I haven't really touched this. Module support, I have module unloading and forcing module unloading, which is pretty standard. For the block layer, I have debug FS enabled. This was for Valgrind or something, I forget which application required it. For partitioning types, I had the legacy MS-DOS partition table support, and I also have the EFI GPT partitioning support. For IO schedulers, I'm using the BFQ IO scheduler. For executable file formats, I didn't change anything. For memory management, I didn't change much either. Um, networking options, there's a lot of 
different options you can play around with inside networking options. But I'm not really familiar with all those options, so I just leave most of them alone unless I have an application that specifically requires certain kernel options enabled. Other than that, inside wireless, we would need to enable CFG 802.11. This is required for pretty much all Wi-Fi cards, so you have to enable it if you're on a laptop or something. And I have Bluetooth enabled even though that I don't really use it, but in the case that I need to, I have it enabled. Okay, device drivers. So inside generic driver options, there's the firmware loader, which is pretty important. So if you're going to have any built-in driver support for hardware that requires external firmware, like Wi-Fi drivers or graphics drivers, then you'll need to have lib firmware in this field. This way the kernel will compile those firmware into the kernel. Otherwise, you would need to set those drivers as modules instead of built into the kernel. But I just leave them as modules. It doesn't really affect me. Inside block devices, I have loopback device support enabled. This is just for so I can read CD-ROMs. Inside my miscellaneous devices, I have the Realtek PCIe card reader enabled, and this is because my laptop has a PCIe card reader for that. So inside SCSI, you'll want to enable S disk support and asynchronous scanning. If you have a CD-ROM, you'll have to enable CD support as well. Inside Serial ATA, this is what I have enabled. It's uh, pretty minimal. I know some other configs, they make you enable other stuff, but this one's worked out for me pretty well. So RAID and LVM, most people think this is just for RAID and LVM, but it's actually more than that. There's the device mapper support, which if you want to do any encryption to your disk or external hard drives, you'll need to have this enabled to be able to decrypt and encrypt them, which is why I have them enabled. Network driver support. A lot of these are because I needed to get VirtualBox working at some point, but the uh, most the important one is the Ethernet driver support. For my laptop, this one has a Realtek. For wireless, I have Intel Wi-Fi. And you can see I enabled it as a module instead of built-in because it requires external firmware. I also have USB network adapters enabled. This was because I was playing around with um, some USB Wi-Fi adapters. Inside input device support, I have just the AT keyboard enabled. For mice, I just have the PS2 and the Synaptics and Alps protocol extension. Hardware bus, I have some Intel options enabled. So hardware monitoring support, I have the Intel Core, Core 2 Atom Temperature Sensor enabled. So all these multifunctional drivers, I only have the Intel ones enabled. Inside multimedia support, I have these options enabled for the webcam on my laptop. So graphics support, I only have the Intel graphics enabled. Even though that this laptop has NVIDIA graphics, I don't, I don't really want to deal with it. So sound card support, I have the HD audio. For this specific laptop's HD audio, it has Konasant HD audio codecs. So I have that enabled. And then I also have the HDMI codecs enabled. I also have the USB sound device support. 
I bought a mic and it's a USB plug-in, so I have to enable this for that to work. So special HID drivers, I think the default configuration has most of these enabled and you pretty much want to disable all of them except for the ones that you need. In my case, I just have one that I actually might need. So USB support is just pretty standard. I have USB 2 and USB 3, which I have enabled. I also have USB mass storage, which is for external hard drives. So x86 platform specific drivers, these are for laptops usually, like volume up, volume down support. Some of the options in here you might not see unless you have other options in the kernel enabled. So you'll need to look around and see which ones you need to have enabled for those to show up. So here I just have WMI keys enabled and also the ThinkPad ACPI extras. File system, I have ext4 and I have butterfs. Butterfs being the main file system that I use, but I also want to read ext4 every now and then. I have Fuse enabled. This is for like my Android phone when you want to connect it via MTP. So for CD-ROM, I just have them enabled as modules. For Windows file systems, I have them enabled to read Windows file systems. For sudo file systems, I have the EFI variable file system enabled. Security options, I don't really touch. Same with cryptography, I don't really touch it much. And library routines as well, I don't really touch it much. Now that we're done configuring our kernel, we can compile it using make and make modules install and make install. I also like to use the dash J option to specify the number of cores I want to use to compile it with. This reduces the amount of time it takes to compile the kernel. So now that we've installed the kernel, it's going to show up in our boot directory. And you can see here we have our VM Linux 5.7.12. The bootloader I use is actually systemd boot. So I have to mount the AEFI partition and then copy over the kernel and then update the entries so that it points to the new kernel. And now we can reboot our system. And you can see after rebooting the system, we are now running 5.7.12. One last thing I want to talk about is the lib folder. Inside the lib folder, you're going to see the firmware directory as well as the modules directory. So inside modules, you can see that there's modules for different kernels that you've installed in the past. This folder might get bigger over time as you keep upgrading kernels. So you might want to delete some of the old modules that you don't need from older kernels. And that's pretty much it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something new. Recently, I've been reading a book called Late Bloomers. And it talks about how today's media and society is pressuring young people more and more to perform and achieve success, causing a lot of stress and mental health on children and young adults today. It also talks about how standard testing is flawed and how it discourages and writes off people that doesn't achieve success at a very young age. Hence the name Late Bloomer, described as someone who achieves their potential later than their expected time. I found this book very interesting, especially as a young person myself who is trying to do well in life. So if this book interests you, I highly recommend it. I'll leave a link to it in the video description. Other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and learned something new, and I'll see you guys in the next one.